Last week we talked about a man that was born blind and all of the implications of that and how God had used him to manifest the works of Jesus in his life. And, and uh, this week Jesus is going to talk about, he's going to use two phrases to describe himself, a couple of the I am statements in the book of John. First of all, I am the door, he's going to say. And secondly, I am the good shepherd. And the, the, I, just, I just want to remind you as we read this and as we read a few passages of scripture, anybody know how you say shepherd in Spanish? Pastor, right? So when we call a preacher a pastor, that is the word shepherd. That's where, that's where that word comes from. That's what that means. So Jesus is the good pastor would be another way of saying that. Or, buen pastor, right? Yeah. All right. John chapter 10, verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice, and a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were, which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and have known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. There was a division, therefore, again, among the Jews for these sayings, and many of them said, He hath a devil, and is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, These are not the words of him that hath a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we ask you to help us understand the Bible this morning. We're grateful for it. We thank you, Lord, that we can have a copy of it in a language that we can understand. And we just pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes, open our hearts to receive what the Holy Spirit has for us today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, you remember, in the Old Testament, there's a psalm. And it's a really famous psalm. Lots of people have memorized the psalm or parts of the psalm, psalm number 23, and what does it say? Who is the shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I want to submit to you today that this is just one more place and one more time that Jesus is saying to the people, I'm God. Because as he calls himself a good shepherd in this, their, their minds would have to go to that passage of Scripture and to remember what David said of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. Well, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. And he's putting two words together there. Number one, good. Remember, there's another place that Jesus encounters this man. He comes to him and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, why do you call me good? There's only one who's good, and that's who? God. And so, if he's the good shepherd... He is saying from two different ways. Number one, I am good. And number two, I am the shepherd. And David's already told us, the Lord is my shepherd. Over and over and over again, Jesus is confronting the traditions of the elders. And that's who he's talking about today, the leadership of the people. Okay. One of the things you've always got to remember is, is that God delegates authority. 
God has formed three spheres of authority in our world. He's laid it out for us in his word. Number one, civil government. Number two, church government. And number three, your family. And within each one of those spheres of government, there is a shepherd in each one of those. There is a, a, a system of law and order and responsibility and authority. God has delegated civil authority to the magistrates. God has delegated church authority to the elders. And God has delegated authority in your family, first of all, to dad. Dad, you're the shepherd of your family. Whether you like it or not, that's the way that it is. It's what God has ordained. And if dad's not around, then mom. And, and so that's what God has laid out for us. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about Jesus. And we're going to talk about the contrast of Jesus being the good shepherd versus the shepherds of Israel. Okay, so number one, Jesus knows his sheep. Jesus knows his sheep. Now watch what he says. Verily, verily. Anytime the, that the, the scripture uses that term, verily, verily, he is super emphasizing something, okay? So verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as the thief and the robber. Now John tells us this is a parable. And so what he's using is, is he's using something that we know about and that we can see to explain something spiritual. So his, his parable is a sheepfold, sheep, shepherds, thieves, robbers, all of these things to these folks would have made perfect sense. Take a drive sometime through the Texas Hill Country. As you do, look around. Look for stacks of rocks. Lots and lots of houses made out of rock. Lots of barns made out of rock. Lots of old uh, watered storage tanks made out of rock and lots of fences made out of rock. Lots of not terribly tall fences made out of rock. What are those for? They're sheepfolds. That's the, the way that people have done it since time is to take and make a pen to put your sheep in. We're not talking about a huge pasture. We're talking about something half the size of this room maybe. And the shepherds of Israel, what they would do is at night they would come and they would put their sheep in there. Sometimes it wasn't even made out of rock. Sometimes it was a brush uh, situation, kind of like the old hedgerows of Texas and Oklahoma back in the day when they planted the bodart trees. They would take and, and literally plant trees in a shape of a, of a pin, and then after a few years they would grow and they would tangle together, and you'd leave one spot for a gate, and you'd pin up your, your cattle, your sheep, your goats in that. So, so when he talks about the fold, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about a pin with a gate, okay? Uh, sometimes they piled stuff up and made a makeshift pin. They went and found them a few trees and piled some brush in there and kind of patched it all up. But one of the things that the ancient uh, uh, shepherds would do is, is they, would, they would graze during the day, and then at night they'd pin them up. Why? because predators operate at night. You don't see predators during the day very often. Sometimes you do, but most of the time not. But if you're going to lose a chicken, when are you going to lose a chicken? Most of the time at night, right? Because a coon, a skunk, your dog, he might do it during the day. But the real predators, the ones that... Y'all have a chicken killing dog, don't you? That's what I heard. Three chickens or three dogs? <laughs> oh, sorry. <clears throat> anyway, so, so uh, it, you know, I mean, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, or right now today, predators get these things, right? So what they would do is they'd pin them up at night. They'd let them out during the day. They'd let them graze during the day. They'd pin them back up at night. We're talking about a world with no fences or very few fences, just free grazing. And here's the other thing that, that helps to understand what Jesus is saying here. One of the things they would do is, is they would share the folds. So you're, you've, got, you've got three or four different shepherds. They all graze their sheep together. And at night, they all pin them together. Well, that means in the morning you got to sort them all because you want to keep yours and you want to make sure that all of yours are there and your buddy, he wants to make sure all of his are there. You don't have individual pins in the fold. You've just got one big fold. And we'll talk about that more in just a minute. But watch what Jesus says about the sheepfold. Now, when he talks about the sheepfold, he's talking about 
believers. He's talking about the nation of Israel. He's talking about the people who are the people of God. Okay? So he says, I say to you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Think about it. If you own the sheep, you just walk right through the door, through the gate. You just walk right in amongst them. You cut your sheep out, or you do what we're going to talk about here in a minute. You... Uh, um, you tend to your sheep, you take care of your sheep, you watch the gate, uh, whatever you're going to do. But if you're being sneaky, if you're going to steal a kid for cabrito, if you're going to steal a lamb, you don't walk through the door, somebody will see you. What do you do? Well, you wait till it gets dark and you climb over the fence. You climb over from the backside, you grab one of them, you sneak back out and you go butcher it. And you steal it and you kill it. And so, so he's using this metaphor. These people grew up with this. They've all seen this. This is as common as, as you and I getting in our vehicles and driving down the street. These folks would have totally understood this. And so he makes a contrast. He says, the thief sneaks in some other way. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth. The guy who's standing there at the gate, when the shepherd walks up, he knows who the shepherd is. He opens up the gate. Hey, these are your sheep. Go right in. Do whatever you need to do, right? And he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. Now see, ancient shepherds talk to their sheep. That's one of the reasons why David has so many psalms. Because while he was talking to his sheep, he sang to them. And he sang to God while he was singing to the sheep. And the sheep hear the shepherd's voice and they follow the shepherd shepherds ancient shepherds don't drive sheep yeah yeah so like john wayne right yeah he always did that drives me crazy we go work cows and somebody goes yeah and everybody turns around and looks at him like use a different word anyway so so cow punchers drive cows but shepherds ancient shepherds did not drive their sheep they talk to them. And in the morning, you might have three or four different shepherds, and they all got their sheep in the fold together, and the one of them would walk out there, and, all right, guys, let's go. Everybody up. Come on, mama. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. My sheep, let's go. And he'd, <laughs> he'd go to whistling. He'd go to singing his song, and his sheep would get up, and they'd just come right out of that whole bunch, and they'd follow him right out the gate. I've got a good friend. He's, a, he's got a bunch of cows, sheep, and goats, and every now and then he'll get me to come help him. And all of his animals, almost all, not, not, not all, but almost all of his animals have been born on that place at this point in time. He, when he started, he bought them and imported them in. But by this time, most of them have been born there. And it's hilarious because, I mean, we can be feeding them. And we'll pull up in his pickup. And I get out and they'll run off. And he gets out and he talks, hey, hey, you know, woo! You know how you call a cow? Woo! Anybody ever call cows? Come on now. Literally, you do. Anyway, you call cows to feed. And do like that, and the cows, here they come, you know. Well, I can call them, do my best cattle call, and they just look at me. And they stand way back, and the old bull, he'll, he'll blow at me, you know, ring his tail. My buddy, he walks out there, and he, whoop, here they come in a trot, you know, rubbing up against him and feeding out of his hand. It's really, it's really funny, actually, to watch it. I, I, he'll be like, you know, he used to, he'd be like, come help me, we'll get him pinned. Now he's like, I'll get him pinned, you come help me once we get him in the pen. Because, because they know him. And they listen to him. They hear his voice. They know the difference between his voice and somebody else's voice. And so, so as you read this, and the reason I'm being, I, I'm sort of being silly, but I'm not. That is how you call cows. And when you do that, and you do that every two times a week, three times a week. After a little while, you walk out there or drive out in the pasture. Most of the time, they come to the pickup. And some guys now have got sirens on their pickup or you honk the horn or you just call them. You want me to do it again? I'll, I'll spare you. Anyway, when you do that over time and, you, and you're with them and these guys lived with them day in, day out. Literally, many times, the shepherd, there wouldn't be a gate they put them in the fold, and then they just make camp right in the gate. And that way, if anybody comes in or anything tries to come in or any sheep try to go out, they know exactly what's happening. You can't get through the gate without kicking the shepherd in his bed 
waking him up so that he's able to pay attention to see what's going on with the sheep. They lived with the sheep. No kidding. I love to, uh, I wish, I wish I could, could get more stories, but when I was a kid, my granddad grew up, he and his brothers in sheep camp a lot. They would, his daddy would lease pasture and uh, be a long ways away from their home, and he would take boys, you know, I mean, boys that were old and responsible, old enough to handle a gun, be away from mom and daddy for all summer long, you know, about 12, and he'd take a, a younger boy that wasn't quite ready for that, maybe about eight. And he'd take them 100 miles, 60, 80 miles away from home, dump them out with two, 300 head of sheep, and say, I'll be back in two weeks. Give them a sack of beans, sack of flour, a mule, a couple of dogs, and away you go. And they were to tend those sheep. No fences, had a rifle, shoot the coyotes, shoot the mountain lions, shoot the bobcats, take care of my sheep. If one of them dies, you cut the ear off so that you know something ate this one. Here's the ears that you're responsible for. At the end, you count the sheep, count the ears. You better have the whole number or else you boys are in trouble. Daddy would be back in two weeks with some more supplies. So where they were raised, where they grew up. This is a practice that's been going on for thousands of years, the practice of shepherding. But he says there, when he putteth forth his own sheep, that's in the morning. He walks into the fold and he calls his sheep. Hey, let's go. And his ewes and his lambs and his bucks, they follow him out. He goeth before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. This is the way the shepherd does it. And a stranger will they not follow. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's hilarious. I'll go help my friend with his cows. I mean, I can have the, he'll give me the sack of cake. Here, go feed them. And they'll just stand back and look at me. I'll walk down through there and shake out some cake, and they'll wait till I'm way down the road a little ways. And then they'll come in. They want that cake so bad they can't stand it. But they don't know me. And they don't trust me. Well, that's what he says about his sheep. A stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not the things they were which he spake unto them. Jesus says the difference between him and the strangers is that he entered by the door. What does that mean? Well, he entered Israel by the door. In other words, God in his word had laid out for years and years and years, this is what the Messiah will look like when he comes. He will be from the tribe of Judah. He will be born in Bethlehem. He will be born of a virgin. Micah, Isaiah, he will be called out of Egypt as the son of God, Hosea. All of the fulfilled prophecy pointed to the fact that Jesus walked in by the door. Everybody else who came saying, I'm the door, were thieves and robbers. He's going to say that in verse 8. All that ever came before me with thieves and robbers. So, so what he's doing is, is he's, he's verifying the reason my sheep hear my voice is because I am the good shepherd and I came in by the door. And I want you to know that Jesus knows his sheep. By the way, it says when he came that the porter opened unto him. I think the porter here refers to John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the guy who was to prepare the way for the Lord. He was the guy who was to open the door. He's standing there at the sheepfold in the door. Here comes the shepherd. Had John the Baptist seen a thief coming, he wouldn't have opened the door. He would have been able to recognize that. As a matter of fact, he did recognize that because when the Pharisees and the scribes came down to the river, what did John the Baptist tell them? He said, you guys need to repent. But when Jesus came, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And he opened the door, and he got out of the way. And the sheep listened to the voice of the shepherd. He calls his sheep by name, and the sheep recognize his voice. Turn with me real quick to Matthew chapter 7. There's an interesting verse of scripture there in verse 29. Verse 28 and 29. It says, and when it came, it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. See, the people, the true sheep, they recognized the voice of Jesus as one who had authority. 
So the porter opens to him, that's John the Baptist. He comes through the gate, all the fulfilled prophecy of the Old Testament that all coincide in the person of Jesus. Rich and Sonia, by the way, brought some books. There's a bunch of them back there on the back table. You're welcome to them. Dig through them. Take anything that you'd like. One of the books that was in there that I snagged up was uh, uh, Josh McDowell's Evidence That Demands a Ver Verdict. Ver edit edi edition volume, I don't know what they're called, one and two. Evidence That Demands a Verdict. If you haven't ever read that book, you should read that book. It's a big one. It'll take you a long time. It's like studying, but it's fantastic. But one of the things that Josh goes into in that book is, is the probability of just seven of the prophecies of Jesus all coming to be fulfilled in one person. And basically, and he copied this from somebody else, but basically what he said was, was he said, in, in, in just those seven prophecies being fulfilled in one person, prophecies, some of them that are hundreds and thousands of years prophesied before he was even born, that it would be like taking the state of Texas, covering it a foot deep in silver dollars, taking one silver dollar and painting it red, randomly throwing it out there, mixing it all up, turning a blind man loose, giving his entire life, telling him you get to pick one time, and when you pick one time, you have to pick the red silver dollar. The probability of those seven prophecies being fulfilled in the person of Jesus is just as big as that guy being successful in picking one silver dollar out of all of those. So you see, when he says he came by the door, that's what he means. There is no way that you can miss Jesus when you look at the prophecies being fulfilled in his life unless you don't want to find Jesus. Unless your heart is hardened, unless your heart is black, unless you refuse to believe. And that's where the shepherds of Israel were at that point in time. Turn with me, if you will, to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. Now remember, we said when we started that, that shepherd and pastor are the same, okay? Okay. And so all throughout the, the, the life of Israel, God has given the people leadership. He's given them pastors, guys like Moses, guys like David, guys like Samuel, some of the judges, different people like that. And so in the time of Jeremiah, listen to what he says. He says, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Now wait a minute. Does a shepherd destroy and scatter the sheep? Well, of course not. Not a real shepherd. Man, I'm going to tell you what. If you've never been around somebody who owns livestock, you really should spend some time around them. Real ranchers, real sheepmen, real cattle people, they take really good care of their animals. They're very careful in the way that they handle them. Even to the point of when I used to work at the cell barn, sometimes when you get cattle in a different environment, they, they get a little bit upset. And uh, uh, when you get them in real tight quarters like a cell barn there's a lot of square corners and cows have big hips and you can if a cow runs into a corner real hard she can break the point of her hip off I've seen it happen a few times and it won't hurt her terrible bad I mean it'll completely bruise that that round but uh, you know it's so interesting to watch the difference between and we'll talk about the hireling here in just a minute the hireling who works there who could care less about these cows they just they're getting a paycheck and they're just jobbing them through as fast as they possibly can versus a real cowman a real cowman takes them easy ease them around the corner the hireling yeah like john wayne right run them over each other pile them up run them off the corner knock their hips off who cares they're going to the packing house anyway you see and so so the the care that a shepherd a true shepherd would take of his of his livestock well i mean he's going to care for them he's going to do everything he can what why why do you take good care of your livestock well first of all god's word tells you to did you know that the old testament says that that a, a person is supposed to care for their animals. But if you don't care for your livestock, that's your livelihood. If you don't take good care of them, you're hurting your bottom line. And nobody would intentionally do that, would they? So 
Look what he says. He says, they, they scatter the sheep and they destroy them, saith the Lord. Verse 2, Jeremiah 23. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds. And they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Can you hear some of the same language there in the book of Jeremiah that we see Jesus saying of himself in the book of John? Now turn to Ezekiel chapter 34. You see, God's had a problem with the shepherds of Israel for a long time. Jeremiah prophesied before the Babylonian captivity. 500 and some odd years before the birth of Jesus. Ezekiel prophesied during the Babylonian captivity. In Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 1 it says, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You know, I can't tell you how many cowmen, sheep men I know that have gone without meals to make sure that their animals had something to eat. It was a rule that I was uh, always had whenever we were traveling that we made sure the horses got taken care of before we did. We never left the horses without having feed and water when we went to, to go back to the room or wherever it was that we were going. Verse 3, he says, You eat the fat and you clothe with the wool. You kill them that are fed, but you feed not the flock. The diseased have you not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick, neither have you bound up that which was broken, neither have you brought again that which was driven away, neither have you sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have you ruled them. This is the problem of the shepherds of Israel. They didn't care about the sheep. They only cared about themselves and they used the sheep for their own ends and their own purposes. Now we look at verse 11. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I even I will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away. And I will bind up that which was broken and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and strong. I will feed them with judgment. I want you to, to see those passages in the Old Testament because God had had a problem with the shepherds of Israel for a long time. And when Jesus comes, he's doing what Ezekiel said he would do. God himself in the flesh had come to gather up his sheep, to call them back, to tend to them, to take care of them, and to model for us what true shepherd really is. So first of all, Jesus knows his sheep. Secondly, Jesus saves his sheep. Jesus saves his sheep. Look at verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. He's going to say this twice. I am the door. Now what's a door? You're like, uh, preacher? Well, but think about it, right? A door is a pretty important thing, especially in your sheepfold. Imagine stacking up rocks in a big circle and not leaving a door. How are you going to get sheep in there? Well, you're going to have to throw them over the edge, then you're going to have to throw them back out again, right? You're going to have to build a ramp. You're going to have to do something. You know, doors are, doors are important. Doors allow entry, access. And he says, I am the door. You know what he's saying when he says, I'm the door? It's just like John 14.6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father by me. The only way to God is to come through the door. Jesus is the door. Not religion. Not the church. Not ritual. Not baptism. Jesus. Jesus is the door. How do you get in? Jesus. He's the entryway. He's the way you get in. So he's the door. Now watch what he says. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. Now, is he talking about Moses here? No. He's not talking about Moses. You want to know why? Because Moses didn't say, I'm the door. 
Moses said, God's going to send the door. Is he talking about David here? No, because David, David said, I'm going to... I'm going to point you to the one that's going to come. Is he talking about Abraham here? No, he's not talking about Abraham. Abraham rejoiced to see his day, and, and he was glad of it. No, he's talking about all those who claim to be the door. He's talking about all those who claim, if you listen to me, I can tell you how to get to, to heaven, that didn't point to Jesus. He says they were thieves and they were robbers. And by the way, that still applies to this day. Everybody who tells you there's any other way to God than through the door is a thief and a robber. There's, there's, there's only one way, and that's through Jesus. That means, and some people might not like it, but Buddha was a thief and a robber. Muhammad was a thief and a robber. Joseph Smith was a thief and a robber. These people are thieves and robbers. We've got many of them in our day as well. You've got to be able to see these things and recognize these things. It's very important. Our job is not to uh, amass followers to ourselves or to our rituals or to our religion or to our organization or to our denomination or to our whatever. Our job is to point people to Jesus. That's our job. Because when people follow the shepherd, well, now they know where the door is. They can come in. They can enter in. So he says, All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Remember, the sheep know the voice of the shepherd. They don't know the voice of somebody else. And it truly is amazing. You know, my dog is the same way. My, my dog is the same way. Anybody who's been to my house knows my little old dog. You come in and she doesn't know you. She's going to bark at you, won't she, Dale? She does. And, and it takes a little while to get to know her. She's kept, by the way, she's partial. She likes girls better than she likes boys. And the taller the boy, the less she likes. I don't know what the deal is. She likes David. And she kind of likes Caden. Sort of. Boy, she doesn't like Jimmy. She doesn't like Mr. Dorman. She doesn't like, you know, most of the people that have been to my house are like, my neighbor's like, your dog is bad. I'm like, she's not bad. She's just loud. But she knows us. See, animals are that away. And here's the deal. You want to know one of the things you always learn about a shepherd? You know what a shepherd smells like? Yeah. Shepherds smell like sheep. Why? Because they hang out with the sheep. They spend time with the sheep. That's what a shepherd truly smells like. A real shepherd smells like the sheep. Now remember, in ancient Israel, political and, and religious leaders are the same thing. Okay? In our day, those things are, are, are different. But we still have shepherds in our land. We elect them. You know what's amazing over the last year and a half? Many of those who have been elected to be our shepherds are inaccessible. You cannot communicate with them. Our legislatures can't communicate with governors. Uh, we can't communicate with the president. We can't talk to, you know, it's completely isolated. What does that tell you? Well, they're certainly not good shepherds who do that. A good shepherd smells like sheep because they spend time with the sheep, okay? I, I, I could pick on pastors as well. Uh, one, one of the things that's, that's a, a phenomenon in our day is the megachurch and, you know, the, the, the megachurch mentality. Now, I'm not necessarily knocking them, but I'm telling you, the bigger the church, the more the responsibility and one of the things that, that it's just impossible, it's impossible for a guy who preaches to 10,000 people to hang out with those people, to interact with those people, to talk to those people, to know those people, to marry those people, to bury those people. It's impossible. And so what does he have to do? He's got to hire a whole bunch of help to do that. Now that's, that's okay, I suppose. I could never do that. I just couldn't. I just, I couldn't. And it's not that I couldn't do it morally. It's that I couldn't do it I could not do that. I'm not smart enough, strong enough, uh, capable enough. There's no way that I could do something like that. But when we get done here in a minute, one of the reasons we have a meal is because I want you to stick around because I want to hang out with you. I want to talk to you. I want to pray with you. I want to get to know you. I want to know your kids. That's, that's because, because we're sheep. Well, hadn't it been fun over the, last, over the last year and a half? All these sheep, you know. Christians just constantly bashing the sheep. I'm like, uh, Jesus says we're sheep. Nobody wants to hear that. You ever been around sheep? Sheep are not necessarily terribly the smartest animal in the barnyard. Hogs are much smarter than sheep. 
Dogs are much smarter than sheep. Uh, why would Jesus use this metaphor? Because he wants us to be followers. He wants us in many ways to be naive. He wants us to be, I mean, sheep are one, one thing about sheep, they, they know a wolf. They recognize that. They know that kind of danger. Sheep are gregarious. You know what that means? It means you don't find one sheep by himself unless something's wrong. She's gone to have her lamb. She's hurt. She's sick. Something's wrong. My granddad used to say you can hang your hat on a cactus and shade a thousand head of sheep. Because you hang your hat and it forms this much shade, one sheep sticks its head in the shade, and other sheep stick their head underneath that sheep, and you, yeah, it'll be a really hot day. You see all these sheep all in one place, and you're like, why do they do that? Because they're shading their head underneath the other used belly. Because they're gregarious. They hang out in a pack. That's us. We're, we're Christians. We're supposed to gather. We're supposed to hang out together, okay? And so, so he says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. If you enter in through the door, you'll be saved. Isn't that great? How do you get saved? You enter in through the door of Jesus by faith. And he shall go in and out and find pasture. You want pasture in your life? See, I grew up around these kind of things and so I, I recognize it. My mom and dad had to sell all their cows last year and they waited an entire year. They just drowthed completely out. Their place looked just like this. Well, this last week, or today, this morning, matter of fact, the first cows are getting back. They bought a bunch of cows again, and here they come. And it's so good because that means they've got pasture. In order to have livestock, you have to have pasture. If you don't have any pasture, the livestock have to go. And so for Jesus to say, if you come in through the door, you'll go in and out and find pasture. You go into the sheepfold at night for protection and safety. You go out the next morning to go out and graze. And that is a healthy situation for the sheep. It's, they're protected. They're cared for. They're tended to. That's what you want. And so that's what he's saying. But verse 10, he says there, he says, The thief cometh not but for to steal. That's what he's going to do. He's going to come steal your lamb. He's going to sneak in. He's going to steal some of your ewes. And by the way, when he tries to steal your ewes, let's say he's able to get some of them out over the edge of the sheepfold, he's going to have to drive them because they're going to be scared of him. So he's going to be running behind them. Ha, 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 because they're going to be scared of him. Had the shepherd come, he would have simply spoken to them and they would have followed him. But once he steals your lamb, what's he going to do with it? He's going to kill it. And they come to destroy. They knock a hole in the edge of your sheepfold so they can drive some of your, your flock out. Folks, this is what Satan does. Look around our world right now. Look at the way people are acting and reacting. Watch BLM with our professional and college athletes putting it on their, their, their uniforms. It's disgraceful. BLM is a terrorist organization. Look at the way they act. They kill police officers. They steal and loot and they destroy property. Does Jesus do that? No. Do Christians do that? No. We do not. Ever. That's not what we're about. It's never been what the church is about. He says the difference is I am come that they might have life. We're the people of life. We offer salvation in the name of Jesus. We point people to the door, and if they go in, they can have life. And that they might have it more abundantly. Isn't that great? I love that. Not just life, but abundant life. What's that mean? Belly deep grass. Not just survival. Belly deep grass. Okay? It's abundant life. It's more than you need. My cup runneth over, the 23rd Psalm says. In Jesus. When I come to Jesus, I have abundance of life. I have this promise of heaven. My sins are forgiven. A new life is given to me. The leadership of the Holy Spirit guiding me and leading me. The Word of God as my guide, as my instruction. My brothers and sisters in Christ, my fellow sheep that we walk through life with. I have the shepherds that God has given to us, the, 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 the good and godly shepherds. Let's talk about those for just a minute. First Peter chapter 5, if you'll turn over there. First Peter chapter 5. 
Now remember, there's three interchangeable words in the New Testament. A lot of churches get these all mixed up. Elder, bishop, and pastor, or shepherd. They all mean the same thing. Same thing. Elder, bishop, pastor. Okay? So if you've got a church that has elders and they're over the pastor, that's wrong. If you've got a church who has uh, a, a bishop that lives in Abilene and he comes down and tells the church what all they're supposed to do, that's wrong. Every local church is autonomous. Elder, bishop, passed up. Inter- interchangeable. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder. This is Peter writing this. He's an apostle. But he says, I'm also an elder. And a witness of sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, feed the flock of God. What is an elder supposed to do? Watch the pastor and make sure he does what he's supposed to do. Nope, not here. So there's a, there's a, well, some of my buddies are part of a denomination, and that's what they think elders are supposed to do, and it's not biblical, it's not right, it's not good. The elders are supposed to feed the flock. And to feed the flock, there the word feed is the verb form of shepherd. So if you were to turn that feed into a noun, it would be shepherd. Shepherd the flock of God, that's the the verb form of it. And if you were to turn it into a noun, it would be talking about a shepherd. So shepherd the flock of God, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Oh, so elders are supposed to have oversight. That is the word episkopos, which is translated bishop in other places, or overseer. So the presbyteros, the elders, the poemen, the shepherds, and the episkopos, the overseer, or the bishop. They're interchangeable. So here he describes how this works its way out, okay? Here's the thing. God carries out his agency through humans. So he delegates authority to us. And in the church, he has established pastors, bishops, elders, to feed us. That's their job. Not to entertain us, although sometimes their feeding is entertaining, and I try really hard to help you with that. Some of you just don't like my jokes, but I'm trying. Amen? But, but it's, it's, to, it's to feed the flock, okay? taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint. I don't force you to be here. I don't force you to listen. I wish I could sometimes, but I can't. But willingly. Now, he's not talking about you. He's talking about me. Elders don't serve by constraint. It's willing. It's willing. I, 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 willing. I have a choice every day. Tomorrow I could decide, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. By the way, preachers have a rule. You can't quit on Monday. <laughs> so I have to wait till Tuesday. Anyway, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I'm here because I want to be here, because I feel like God has called me to be here. That's the way it should be. And not for filthy lucre. In other words, not to use the people to get rich, but of a ready mind. Neither is being lords over God's heritage. A shepherd is not supposed to be a lord over God's heritage. Do you know in the book of Revelation, Jesus says, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Nico, some of you have on a pair of Nikes, right? Victory. Laos. The people. Jesus says, I hate the deeds of the people who have victory over the people. That means, I hate the guys who wear the fancy clothes and who set themselves on a pedestal and look down on the normal, average, everyday people. (gasps) Look around at how much of quote-unquote church is designed like that. That somehow the guy who stands up here is better than somebody else. Listen to me. I got thrown off of a guy's <laughs> porch right over here one day because he was telling me that he had gone and made confession and that he had uh, uh, to his priest. And I said, well, what if your priest in that day? And my, 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 my point was was you make confession to Jesus. You talk to Jesus. You confess your sins to Jesus, not to a man. We don't have a... I know it looks like it, but that's not a confessional back there. (laughs) By the way, I don't want to hear it. But anyway, you need to talk to Jesus and confess your sins to Jesus, right? So anyway, over here one day, I said, what if your priest had sinned that day? And he was really upset with me and told me to get off of his porch and get away from him. And so I did. But a real shepherd 
is delegated by Jesus to feed the flock, to love the people, and not to lord it over them, not to impose his own reign and rule over them, not to, you know, I, I've, I've met people before, and there was a particular cult that a lot of people got caught up in, and, and the, the idea of shepherding in this particular group was so strong that before they made any kind of financial decision, they had to come talk to the preacher. Before they made any kind of, uh, you know, and I'm like, so the preacher is omniscient, right? He knows everything about finances. He knows everything about whether you should purchase a new property or not. He knows everything about, you know, before, if you had a problem with your kid, you went and talked to the preacher first, and then he told you exactly how to handle it. And I'm going, I met some of these folks one time, and I'm going, you put way too much faith in your preacher, man. You need to talk to Jesus about those. Anyway, anyway. So, so he goes on and he says, neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. The preacher's supposed to be an example to the flock. That scares me to death. But watch what he says in verse 4. And when the chief shepherd, and the King James Version capitalizes shepherd, and I think rightly so, because he's talking about Jesus, because he's the chief shepherd. So he's the good shepherd, he's the chief shepherd. When he shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. See, that's the, the shepherd's job. But the shepherds of Israel, they were acting like thieves. They were stealing from the people, killing the people, destroying the people. And that is motivated by Satan. So Jesus saves the sheep, and he gives the sheep life. And he gives abundantly. Turn with me real quick to Numbers chapter 27. Numbers chapter 27. Look with me please at verses 16 and 17. It says there, <clears throat> verse 15, Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. So Moses is praying to God. And he says, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as a sheep which have no shepherd. See, that's, that's what Moses prayed for. God's going to do that in the man Joshua, but ultimately God is going to give us his son, Jesus, the door, the good shepherd. Number three, Jesus gives his life for the sheep. Jesus knows the sheep, Jesus saves the sheep, and Jesus gives his life for the sheep. Look what he says here in verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is in hireling. Now, I don't, I don't know if you use that term or not. I use that term a lot for two reasons. One, because I've learned about it in the Bible. And two, because I was raised seeing this happen. Right now, you're seeing it very, very easily. You're seeing it with labor in our country. Hirelings. What is a hireling? A hireling is a person who cares nothing about the business, is simply there for the paycheck. Now, as Christians, in our jobs, we have to be very careful that we're not a hireling. Okay? Jesus says that we are to serve our employers as we serve the Lord. Now, a hireling could never do that, but a hireling is easy. A hireling will quit their job to go take money from the government because they hate their job, they hate their boss, they don't want to work, they don't want to do anything, they'd love to just, just have the, the money. That's the only reason they're there. What does the hireling do? Does the hireling take care of the boss's stuff? No, they could care less. You can tell a hireling whenever you see them driving a piece of equipment way too fast down a two-rut road. Ba-boom, 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 and just tearing it all to pieces. When you walk up to somebody's place and you see all this equipment just tore all to pieces and a whole bunch of people working there, you know this poor guy's got a bunch of hirelings because they don't take care of things. They don't look after the boss's best interest at all. They're just there for the money. Now, Jesus says, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, is willing to lay down his life for the sheep. But he that's a hireling and not the shepherd, his own sheep or not. See, that's the deal. The hireling is not invested in the life of the sheep. They could care less about the sheep. They're just there for the money. They see the wolf coming and they leave the sheep and flee. You see, that's one of the reasons why, and you read about this in the book of Genesis, when Jacob served Laban seven years for, it turned out, Leah, he was, he was in, <laughs> he was supposed to be serving for Rachel, he wound up with Leah, 
Then he served another seven years for Rachel. When he was doing that, one of the things Jacob points out is, is that none of Laban's flock went missing that weren't accounted for. And he was responsible for all of them. You see, that's a guy who has a vested interest in the situation. But the hireling doesn't. He could care less. The wolf is dangerous, so he runs. Instead of putting himself between the wolf and the sheep to protect the sheep, he runs away. Okay, That's the hireling. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he's an hireling and careth not for the sheep. And that's the bottom line. Listen to me. There's two kinds of people in this world in the leadership positions that they have. And I don't care whether it's a daddy, I don't care whether it's an elected official, whether it's a pastor, whether it's a, a, a coach, whether it's a, a school teacher, I don't care if it's the, the CEO of a business. There are people who care about people and there are people who could care less about people. And the people who care about people try to help the people flourish. They try to help the people do well. If your employees are happy, you will have a better work environment. Guarantee you. If your employees are not happy, your work environment will be miserable. And if you are a boss, if you are in a position of authority, and you are simply a hireling, well, you don't care about the people who work for you. You could care less about the people. And it's it's really pretty easy to tell when you get into that kind of situation. Now, what had happened in Israel is, is you had political and religious leaders who were hirelings. They didn't care about the people. They could care less about the people. They were out for themselves. Notice how Ezekiel and Jeremiah told us, you eat the fat of the flock, but you don't help to feed the sheep. You go through and you pick out what you want but you're not helping the whole... The whole flock should be in good flesh if they've been tended to and taken care of. Okay? And so, so he is using this word hireling to talk about the scribes, the Pharisees, the chief priests. This is who he's... He's telling them, you guys are a bunch of hirelings. Because when the wolf comes, you could care less. You just run away and try to save yourself. The difference, the contrast is Jesus says, I give my life for the sheep. I give my life for the sheep. So he says there, Jesus is going to say in another place, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And so, so he says, I'm the good shepherd, I know my sheep, and am known of mine. What a great verse. The good shepherd, not only does he know his sheep, but his sheep know him. They recognize his voice. Did you know the devil always gives you a number, but Jesus gives you a name? Did you know that? By the way, it's a great passage. It's a great message by Adrian Rogers. You should look it up and listen to it sometime. <laughs> Fantastic. Anyway, so he goes on and he says, verse 15, As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father. So he's saying, he's saying in the same way, now think about this, in the same way that Jesus the Son knows God the Father, the intimacy of relationship that's there, he says, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Now that's pretty close. That's the kind of relationship that you and I can have with Jesus through the Holy Spirit as he lives in us. And he says, Even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which were not of this fold. Now this was hard for Israel to hear, but he's talking about the Gentiles here. He says, Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Isn't that magnificent? You know in the church there's neither Jew nor Greek. Did you know that? Jews are not saved any other way than what you and I are saved. I don't care what some TV preacher says, and I don't care what they say in Israel or, or New Jersey. Jewish people are not saved by keeping the law. Never will be, never have been. They are saved by faith in Christ. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But he has one fold that's made up of human beings, Jew and Gentile. And aren't you grateful? I don't know about you. You may be Jewish. I'm not. But it wouldn't matter. Because I know God because of Jesus. He's the door. He's the only way in. By the way, he's talking to a 100% Jewish audience as he says these things. He says, I have other sheep. I'm going to bring them into the fold as well. And then he, he goes on to say, verse 17, Therefore does my Father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. 
Now, now think about it. There is a huge difference between laying down your life and having it taken for you. There's a huge, one of them is willing, the other is compulsory, right? Most of us in this room uh, are going to have to have our life taken from us unless our love gets in the way. For instance, if I'm by myself and somebody wants to take my life, they're going to have to take it. I'm not going to willingly give it. But if I'm with my wife and my kids, I would gladly give myself so that they could be free. And you would too, wouldn't you? Well, see, that's what he's saying. Now, this is fantastic. And don't ever think that the cross is some tragedy that Jesus lost his life in because it's not true. He willingly gave his life and he did it for you and me. So he says, therefore, do my father love me. Verse 18, no man taketh it from me. He was in absolute, complete control throughout the entire thing. But I lay it down on myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. And there he's talking about the resurrection from the dead. So he's, he's, he's telling us all that's going to happen before it happens. And then he says, this commandment have I received of my Father. So once again, verse 19 tells us there was a division, therefore, among the Jews for these sayings. Always and forever, never forget it. Never forget it. Anytime Jesus preaches, anytime Jesus is preached, there is a division. Always. Don't be surprised when it happens. When you share the gospel with people, sometimes people are going to reject that. But some people aren't. Some people are going to receive Christ and some people aren't. And some people aren't yet. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever give up on them. If they're still breathing, they've got a chance. So he says in verse 20, And many of them said, so here we are back to the same thing that we saw in the last chapter. Many of them said, He hath a devil. See, they just want to write him off completely. He's mad. Why hear you him? If they can say that he has a devil, that he's demon-possessed, then they can completely write him off. But the other group says, These are not the words of him that hath a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? And so the miracle, the Jews require a sign, right? The miracle of healing the blind man it has, has helped some of them to at least think through and listen to a little bit more of what Jesus has to say. I just want to encourage you this morning. I, I absolutely love this passage of Scripture because I love the metaphor of the shepherd. You know, I know that we want to be lions. I know that we do, but we're not. Sorry, we're sheep. And sheep, you know the lion? The lion, he's big, he's strong, he's independent. Actually, that's not true. He's lazy. She's strong, independent. She brings home the bacon. He just shows up and eats it. He, I mean, watch the documentaries on the lion or go to the zoo. Man, I love, they had the lions in, in Abilene. I love it. They had two of those male lions. All day long, right? Every time you see them, they just, uh, they'd look up, you know, oh, it's stretch, and back down they go. The lioness... She's out there getting it done, right? She's the one. She's going and getting. She's like, well, big boy, you're just going to lay around here all day. I've got to go get a gazelle or something because I'm hungry. We've got all these cubs we've got to feed, right? I know we want to be lions, but we're not. God says we're sheep. And so we're not strong. We're not independent. We're not fierce. We're just not. If we are, we're in the flesh. We're weak. We are dependent. But Jesus says, apart from me you can do nothing, but I can do all things through him which strengtheneth me. Julia shared us that passage in Philippians 4.13 with us this morning. You see, the sheep are dependent upon the shepherd. We've got to hear his voice every day. Every day, every night you go into the fold so that you can be protected. You go into Jesus and you get protected, protection from Him. He's the one who keeps the wolf at bay. He's the one who fights off the enemy. Every morning we get up, we get our word, we get our armor on, and we listen. And we hear the shepherd's voice. And when we hear the shepherd's voice, then we head off to whichever direction. How do we find pasture? Do we go look for it? pull ourselves up by our bootstraps? No, we follow the shepherd. He leads us to the still waters. He beds us down beside the still waters. He leads us to the green pastures. We have to follow him. 
You know, one of the one of the things that that's so hard for American, especially American men, is to come to this realization that that I'm a sheep and I've got to follow the shepherd, that I am dependent upon the shepherd. But listen to me. He is the good shepherd and he is the door. And if you go in by the door, you'll be saved. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we thank you and we praise you. Jesus, we're so grateful that you're the shepherd and we need you, Lord. Your word says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God, every, every question that I have, you have the answer. Every need that I have, you are the answer and the fulfillment of that need. And so, Lord, I just thank you that we can come to you today, that we can listen for your voice, that we can flee from the, the stranger, from the thief and the robber, that we don't have to put up with the hireling and his incompetency. But, Lord, we can know you, the good shepherd. And we can enter in by you, the door. Right now, Lord, we just give you this time. We pray, Lord, that you would do a work of grace in our lives and our hearts. Help us, Lord, to just keep our eyes fixed on you. And during this time, Lord, we pray that we just do business with you in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray.